This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. The outline of my talk today, and yes, I am using the F word. Um, I, I know it's become very unfashionable to talk about feminism. And for those of you who are interns and students at the university, I hope that I um, can re-energize um, some of the true meaning and the spirit of that word, uh, the radical notion that men and women, and indeed all human beings, should be treated with equal respect equal dignity and equal rights. Um, if that's what's going to make us cringe, then go ahead and cringe by all, by all, um, <laughs> I, have, I have no hesitation about that. I'm going to start by sharing, for those of you who don't know that much about the Global Fund, a little bit about the Global Fund because so much of what I've learned about this exciting and inspiring vision for how I believe things can change in the world has come from my 13 years of experience at the Global Fund. I want to share with you um, three stories of ways in which I see um, women's activism and leadership offering us hope and potential for thinking differently about some of the major challenges that face our world, militarism, climate change, natural disasters. Um, and I want to suggest that women in poor and underserved communities, as well as women in very privileged and well-off communities, are not waiting for governments, private corporations, a UN global agreement, um, or a UN peacekeeping force, for that matter, to kind of um, transform their lives. They are truly recognizing that they are the ones they've been waiting for, and they're ready to begin to start making change and are indeed showing us the way. Um, and then I want to share with, leave us with some thoughts about how each of us, individuals as well as um, communities, community foundations can begin to do something about making the kinds of investments uh, that could try and make a difference. So let's start um, at the Global Fund. For 13 years I've been privileged and very humbled to do this work with an organization that as uh, Wade mentioned is now the largest um, grant making foundation specifically focused on women's human rights. Um, that sounds very grand, especially when you have a name like Global and you work in 171 countries. But to put it in some perspective, um, in a country which last year spent close to $100 billion in private philanthropy and in which less than 6.7% of total giving went to women and girls, the Global Fund gives away $8.5 million a year. Um, but since the time we began, we have given away over $70 million in grants to thousands of women's groups in over 171 countries. Our founders were convinced that women's human rights and dignity were key to the advancement of any global agenda for change. Our grant-making program was based on the somewhat radical assumption that it was people in their own communities, and women particularly, who actually had answers, not only had a good analysis of the problems that they were facing, but actually had very creative ideas for solutions to those problems. Our founding mothers had no doubt that when women had access to resources, were healthy, and had the opportunity to contribute to their family's well-being, that not only would they flourish, but so would everyone around them. So to us, it's always been crystal clear, if you will, that advancing women's rights, giving them access to technology, to political participation and economic independence um, was not just the right thing to do, but it was also the smart thing to do and perhaps one of the most effective ways to move us towards a more just and sustainable world. Um, but as Harry Belafonte once sang, it was clear as mud, but it covered the ground and the confusion made me brain go round. It might have seemed evident to us, but it has taken a long time for these truths to become evident to a larger constituency. Sometimes it has felt maddeningly slow that it has been over 20 years in which fellow funders, philanthropists, policymakers, or indeed even journalists like Nicholas Kristof 
took coming to the cause. He describes himself and his wife, Cheryl Woodan, a classmate of mine at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, as recent converts to the cause. And we welcome these recent converts to the cause. And I think the good news for us is, however maddeningly slow it might have felt to us, that change has arrived. It is here. Everyone from the World Bank to the CEO of ExxonMobil is talking about investing in women. And I think we can begin to hope for a 21st century in which women's rights are actually seen as one of the preeminent causes that we mobilize around as a global community. If you're a numbers person, the numbers speak fairly loudly for themselves. Do turn off your cell phones, because I can shout really loudly. Um, when you ensure women's right to education, child mortality drops by 10%. An extra year of education beyond the fourth grade also ensures that a woman's own risk of contracting HIV AIDS drops by 50%. Um, we celebrate that momentum that is so evident now around us from books like Half the Sky um, that um, Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wudan um, just published in, in September and that actually tell the story of a number of organizations that were grantee partners with the Global Fund for Women. And we look forward to a day when that rhetoric will, will, will transform itself into a place where actually the resources follow the rhetoric. In our experience as an organization that receives over 3,000 requests from women's groups from all over the world, in any language, I think we're the only foundation I know of that accepts proposals in Kiswahili or Arabic or Japanese. Um, we find incredible seeds of hope and potential in these requests that women are bringing us. In some sense, maybe you could compare us to a venture capital fund. Maybe it's not an accident that we were born in Palo Alto and that some of our early founders um, included people like Bill Hewlett and David Packard, who liked the idea of this kitchen startup, if you will. Um, yes, not every organization we invest in will turn into the Google of the social entrepreneur world or the Facebook, but I think the creation of a community that actually makes it possible for these ideas to thrive and the notion of creating social profit, which is what the women's groups that we are working with are really doing in their communities, is what gives us the sense of incredible potential. These $8.5 million that we award in grants every year are turned into new schools, into hotlines against violence, into legal counsel for survivors of violence, into care for AIDS patients, into clinics that offer safe access to contraception, into safe houses for trafficked girls, and green job training programs, and into programs that allow women for the first time to understand what it means to have the right to vote, something that Alice Paul and her sisters might have used had they had access to a global fund for women in 1917 when they protested outside Woodrow Wilson's White House. They also transform the lives of the thousands of women and girls whose lives they touch, giving voice to their priorities, giving a sense that families, governments, and decision makers at all levels begin to pay attention to what women are saying about their priorities. And we know this from healthcare to policy making, that failure to include how things affect women differently and uniquely um, really result in broader failure of the policies themselves. These small and flexible amounts of money, an average size grant at the Global Fund is $10,000, but we make grants as small as $2,000 and as large as $50,000 a year, are also helping us to give, get some glimpse into some of the ways in which we might challenge some of the world's most intractable problems. Um, for example, how to address the growing problem of militarization, the way in which we now see the world moving towards one in which force and the use of weapons and the use of arms is seen as the appropriate way to resolve all conflicts. No one has had to pay the price for that kind of direction in terms of our world's growth and transformation as women have. From Korea to Okinawa, from Bosnia to Abkhazia, and of course, most recently and most painfully in places like the Congo, we have seen how women are paying a huge and incredible price for the ways in which their bodies actually are um, 
battlegrounds for what is happening in terms of the increased militarization in their societies. What I want to share with you about the Congo is perhaps a little bit different than what we hear in the news. Nick Kristof said in his book, the Congo is the rape capital of the world. But at the Global Fund, we hear from the 70 women's organizations that we've supported in the last five, six years in the DRC, that women are not only victims of violence, they are also the leaders of a movement for change and transformation in the Congo. Of course, the statistics are chilling. Since 1998, over 6 million Congolese people have died. Um, half a million women are estimated to have been raped. 30% of rape victims in Eastern Congo are HIV positive. Unemployment is at 85%. And 45% of all women are illiterate. The DRC is also one of the four countries in the world with the highest maternal mortality rates. Another one is, Af is Afghanistan. But what we don't hear in mainstream reporting about the Congo, and that we hear at the Global Fund for Women, at the Global Fund for Women from the women's groups that we support in places like the Congo, is the larger context within which this is happening. So we are reminded by women in the Congo that it is not just that there's something wrong with their men, or that there is something bad about their culture, or that there is something fundamentally flawed about their civilization. We are reminded by Congolese women of the brutal history of colonialism in that part of the world. We are reminded by them of the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide and the militias that roam freely across the Congo that are funded by the Rwandan government. They remind us of the continued mineral ex extraction by multinational corporations, and they remind us of the fact that the France, UK, and the United States together earned more last year in sales of small weapons to the Congo than the total amount of humanitarian assistance that those countries put into the Congo. These are the statistics that women in the Congo are reminding us about. Um, they are also reminding us that those little machines that we can't live without called cell phones depend on a mineral called coltan. In fact, the Congo has 80% of the world's reserves of, of coltan. If we really cared about making a difference in the Congo, women there say to us, speak out, talk to every cell phone manufacturer, demand that there be a change in the practices that somehow enable the large manufacturers to continue to extract minerals while this violence continues. And reminding us that very often it is militias that are actually paid for by corporations that extract the kind of violence and, Im th and that inflict the kind of violence that we hear of from women. So the kind of gross sexualized violence that women have been inflicted on the Congo is not something I need to tell you about, though the Global Fund for Women is coming out with a report co-authored um, by my colleague Mwadi Mukenge, um, who is herself a refugee from the Congo, talking about the brutality that happens on a daily basis. Communities being taught a lesson by being brought together to witness the rape of women in their communities, which is intended to humiliate, to traumatize, and to silence people's voices. These are experiences that are extraordinarily difficult to name, um, much less to overcome. But as early as 2003, women's groups in the Congo saw an opportunity in the signing of the peace accords to not only push for political and economic change, but also to highlight the already unequal gender dynamics within Congo's entrenched patriarchy. In 2004, we heard an urgent call for support from hundreds of Congolese women's organizations. And since 2005, we've made over a million dollars of investments in more than 70 women's groups. Um, we've held three gatherings in that region, bringing together women from Burundi, from Rwanda, and Congo, talking about how they can support each other in the struggles that they face. They've been instrumental, women have been instrumental in educating and mobilizing Congolese women to participate in elections, to find their voice, to demand a different solution, to hold perpetrators of violence accountable. They passed a landmark bill, again, something we don't hear about when we hear about the women who've been raped that criminalized sexual violence, that includes mandatory sentencing for rape, including those committed by army officers and soldiers, and addressing the question of forced early child marriage. 
one of the groups that we've worked with is SOFAD, and one of the women that we've gotten to know is the founder of SOFAD, um, a, a, a young woman called Katana Bukuru, who won the prestigious Frontline Defenders Award. They've managed to build 50 peace networks that link over 20,000 women and youth in villages across Eastern Congo. They've used these networks to help victims of sexual violence to access support and legal recourse, but they've also engaged community leaders and armed groups to stop the sale and the proliferation of arms in their community. Uh, most recently, and this might um, be something you may not think about as a way to um, mobilize against violence in your community, a group of young people brought out a CD of songs celebrating um, nonviolent methods in which you could resolve conflict and particularly talking about um, celebrating women's position, rights, and dignity within their community. Women like Katana give me a huge amount of hope um, for the role of the women's movement in resisting and dismantling militarism worldwide. But the planet faces other kinds of sometimes overwhelming challenges that we feel incapable of finding solutions to. Um, amongst them, gross environmental degradation and climate change, to say, to mention a few. As in the case of the Congo, I think what we get a sense of from hearing from women's organizations is to go beyond what is immediately apparent. Yes, we hear from scientists that the seas are rising. Yes, we hear that the Arctic caps are melting. But I think women's groups are talking about what are the root causes that underlie the pace of development and the pace of environmental change. Foremost amongst them is the immense and unsustainable stress that our current model for economic progress places upon the planet and its complex ecosystems of human beings, earth, water, and air. Indeed, the model that we currently have of so-called so globalization and progress um, emphasizes industrialization at all levels, even with regard to the production of food. We're now going back to ways of producing food that you know, my grandparents and your grandparents took for granted. We now call it organic farming. Um, but there was a different way of producing food that we knew of. And yet, in the rest of the world, the model being sold is still the model that we used here in the West for so long. From meat-heavy diets to a growing appetite for fuel-consuming cars and other icons of first world lifestyles, Thomas Friedman talks about the fact that there are entire groups of people who he refers to as Americans who live, whether they live in Mumbai or Shanghai or Rio de Janeiro, their patterns of consumption, what they aspire to, how they want to live, um, are based on the models that we have seen here in the West. And of course, they are completely unsustainable models. Um, as Gandhi reminded us, this is a world that has more than enough to satisfy every individual's needs, but not enough to satisfy every individual's greed. And I think part of what women in local communities are encouraging us to think about is um, how can we begin to shift our own sense of what progress means? How can we begin to think about the fact that these incredible increases in wealth on the one hand mask a growing divide between those who have far more than they could possibly consume uh, at any one meal, um, whether that's supersize me or not, or at any, or, or really in any one lifetime, and how that masks the huge underbelly of those who really live on less than $2 a day. Um, the many, many people who have not reaped the rewards of globalization, and in parts of the world, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, are actually poorer than they were 20 years ago. Um, this poverty makes them even more vulnerable to threats in the environment. And again, we see women and girls who are on the front line of experiencing environmental change. What do I mean by this? Well, women and girls are the ones who collect water and firewood across the world. The first time you, they notice that they are walking three miles extra or four miles extra or a whole hour extra to collect the firewood that once was right outside their huts, they realize that something is changing in their communities. I remember a few years ago, I walked up three hours up a hillside that was almost completely barren in Nepal with a 
Nepali women's organization that had fiercely resisted the um, selling of one last piece of forest on their hillside. Um, they showed me how their hills had once been covered with a full and lush um, plant life, including the beautiful Himalayan rhododendrons. They told me about the traditional Ayurvedic herbs that they would gather that grow in the shadow of those large trees. And they spoke with sadness about the growing poverty and alcoholism in their communities that had essentially caused a situation where large logging companies were able to come in and buy um, forests for really not very much. And they said, but we don't own the land. That's not something we as women have ever had the right to do. And we couldn't do anything until we came together in a women's group, pooled our money, and then physically stood around this patch of forest that was left um, in our community and demanded that we protect that, that that forest be protected. They also went on to mobilize and push the Nepali government to start a program of reforestation in their community. Um, these are the ways in which you might argue that women and girls could be for us as a planet an early warning system, if you will, of environmental destruction. But perhaps the most compelling reason for us to think about why women might be the eco-warriors of the future is that our own bodies are the most revealing indicators of what is wrong with the planet. Ecologist Sandra, Sandra Steingraber puts it brilliantly when she reminds us that the womb is the first ecosystem for every human being. And as it turns out, women's wombs are remarkably sensitive indicators of what is out of whack in the rest of our world. This is what led one of our grantee partners, Oral Atani Azova in Uzbekistan, uh, who is a gynecologist, to begin to make the connection between what she was seeing in terms of birth defects and um, problems with women's gynecological um, health and what she saw in the terms of unbelievable use of pesticides in the agricultural economy of Uzbekistan. Frightened at what she was seeing, she and her organization began to mobilize around issues of sustainable agriculture. We gave them a $5,000 grant to get started and get the program off the ground. And slowly, over the last 10 years, Cent per Cent has changed agricultural practice and encouraged organic farming in the region. A few years ago, Oral came up to San Francisco and was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize, which is sort of like the Nobel Prize for the environment. Um, as she did so, she accepted her award, a $125,000 gift, and the next day promptly found herself in our office. And we said, Oral, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm coming as donor, not as grantee. And we were like, what are you talking about? Do you need this money? And she said, no, there are a thousand other Orals, and they all need their first $5,000. And that's the kind of work that the Global Fund for Women has been able to do. And those are the kinds of people who I think are beginning to see this connection. Um, women aren't tolerating the rape of our planet, just as they are no longer tolerating the rape of women themselves. And I think they are seeing those connections in ways that are profoundly important for us to recognize and for us to be able to respond to. Small fisher women's groups that we hear from in Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka and even off the coast of Somalia are reminding us that things like the piracy that we see, these young men who are getting on these boats and you know, who we see as terrorists, what has happened off the coast of Somalia is something most people don't understand. Those waters were once rich with fish. People fished those waters. These young Somali men are fishermen who have no jobs because there are no fish. Those waters have been so overfished by massive, huge fishing trawlers. And these young men have no way of making a living, any kind of making a living. And it's fascinating to me to see how the issues that we see as being very distinct, on the one hand, ecological change, on the other hand, the growth of violence and terror and the fear that we have of a growing form of um, sort of attacking our way of life as we know it are so interconnected and so bound up with one another. So I guess it wasn't a surprise to us at the Global Fund when we conducted a survey in 2007 when we were doing our strategic planning process and women identified climate change and growing militarism as two of the biggest threats that they saw 
to women realizing their human rights, but also to the sustainability and the ability for us to think about what was going to happen in the years ahead. Uh, we all looked at the Copenhagen Climate Conference as a way of sort of maybe giving us some hope, and I think um, many of us were disappointed when we walked away without an agreement. Um, yet there were some small signs of hope. The little island nation of Tuvalu stood up and mounted what could be called nothing less than a David and Goliath confrontation as they demanded that the big polluting giants that are responsible for more than 65% of all greenhouse gases, the US, Australia, Brazil, China, India, Canada, Japan, and the EU, really step up and talk about what it would mean for countries, particularly small island countries, which literally will not exist anymore if the continued trends go on. Our commitment at the Global Fund is to give voice to the actions of people in these communities, including people in Fiji, um, where a wonderful organization called the Women's Action for Change is a group that has been actually talking not about climate change, but what they call destabilization. Because in villages across Fiji, as in other um, small island nations, women are not only moving inland, they're actually leaving those nations. And where are they going? They're going to places like Australia. They're going to places like New Zealand, where then new dilemmas get set up as migration causes tension. I don't know how many of you may have heard recently about the issues in Australia where a young Indian student was killed. Um, the tensions that we have in our societies right now, where people from poorer countries are coming to richer countries in the form of migrants, and then what we do as societies that have to deal with that pressure of migration, um, are we going to respond from a place of common shared humanity, or are we going to respond from a place of saying they have no business being here? And more and more, I think we will not just be faced with economic refugees, but with climate change refugees. I want to end with, a, with a, another reason for us to really take very seriously the issues around um, why women's voices are so important for us to be able to listen to. Um, all of the ones I've given are certainly powerful and compelling, but a final reason for us to really pay attention to questions around environmental change is the disproportionate impact that natural disasters, often caused by decades of man-made neglect and excess, such as tsunamis and earthquakes, have on women and children. When the Haiti earthquake struck in early January, we were grimly reminded of some of these statistics that the Women's Environmental and Development Organization put together. Women and children are 14 times more likely to die than men during natural disasters. Over 70% of the dead in the Asian tsunami, for example, were women. In many parts of the world, women are not allowed to leave their homes without a male companion. So in times of natural disasters, they have a limited ability to respond. In many other parts of the world, because it's not considered appropriate or ladylike, women and girls are not taught basic survival skills, not how to swim, not how to run, not how to climb a tree, not how to do any of the basic things that might actually help save your life in a disaster. These gender inequalities that already defined women's lives prior to a natural disaster therefore make them so much more vulnerable at a time of a natural disaster. And yet, what we've just seen in Haiti, and I don't know how many of you were as moved as I was when you saw the New York Times um, pictures of the change that has happened since they've instituted a system of vouchers for distributing food and required that actually women are the only ones who can actually pick up that food from a scene of actually mass chaos in which men were basically um, mobbing food trucks. And it was, again, a case of might is right and who could actually get to those food trucks faster. You now have a situation where Haitian women are actually doing what they've always done in remarkable circumstances, making sure that the resources get to those who need it the most. Um, we've had some of that experience um, in terms of our interaction with women in Haiti, where we've been active since 1991. Um, the statistics about Haiti and the way in which you read about it in the paper, again, are easy for us to dismiss. The poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, that's how most, most 
articles beginning about Haiti will start. What it doesn't tell you is that Haiti has an incredible history as the first country in the world to overcome slavery. The first place where there were actually a slave uprising and a free Haiti. Haiti was the first nation to throw off colonialism um, and paid a very high and brutal price for it. One that I think must have made many Haitians think twice about the presence of US troops on their soil because US troops have been there in not such wonderful circumstances, often more as an occupying army instead of bringing um, resources. On the other hand, I think Haitians have been incredibly grateful for the outpouring of support that has come from all over the world and especially here in the United States. Um, we feel very proud because our first grant in Haiti was to an extraordinary group of, of peasant women who we later found out as I met Paul Farmer last year for the first time and he jumped up when I introduced myself and said I was from the Global Fund for Women. He said, you gave us our first grant in Haiti. And I said, we did? Um, he said, yes, because Partners in Health has always believed that we should partner with local organizations and it was women who welcomed the work that we did in health and it was a Haitian Peasants Women Association that applied to the Global Fund for a $5,000 grant in 1991 and Paul Farmer to this day recognizes our commitment to that engagement with groups on the ground. I think that there has been an incredible response from, from donors certainly at all levels but I think what was even more moving for us as, as an organization committed to and seeing this notion of sort of building community was the outpouring of response from other women's organizations, many of our grantees in the Latin America and Caribbean region. Um, CAFRA, the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action, collaborated with the National Association for Research on Women in Haiti to actually have, they've set up what they're calling a feminist camp on the border between um, the Dominican Republic and, um, and Haiti to advocate for gender sensitive aid distribution. In fact, it was their work that got, um, successfully got big aid agencies to change their strategy of distributing food to make sure that they had these vouchers that went to women. The purpose of this camp is to create a holistic healing center and a legal clinic for women's human rights defenders. Unfortunately, once all the attention is gone and the attention will, will go away, as we know from other places where there have been crises, the real work of rebuilding Haiti will begin. And I think that's where women have played such an extraordinary role, whether it's been Rwanda, whether it's the former um, uh, Yugoslavia or the Balkans. Um, you see women now 10, 15, 20 years after the crises that we um, once had a spotlight on still slowly rebuilding in the aftermath. And I think that's where the resources and the ability for us to kind of make sustained investments in what women are doing on the ground are going to be so important. And it was incredibly moving to me, for example, to hear uh, one of our advisors, Patricia Guerrero from Colombia, who herself has worked with displaced women in a country that has been beset by civil war, um, stand up and offer her services to Haitian women because one of the um, most common outcomes right in the aftermath of a terrible um, natural disaster is increased sexual violence against women um, in those circumstances, M many times because women have lost the primary providers um, or are displaced or are vulnerable. This is a chorus, I guess, maybe as someone who's a singer, um, this is a chorus of voices that I don't think can be ignored for much longer. I don't think it is willing to stand by and watch us try and take on some of the most challenging issues of our time without their participation, without their progress. Um, I think sometimes people feel, how could we possibly make a difference? The kinds of issues we're dealing with are so overwhelming. And earlier today we were in St. Louis Obispo and a uh, rabbi began um, our, our our event by talking about one of my favorite quotes from the, from the Talmud, um, do not be overwhelmed by the world's grief. Um, it is not incumbent on you to address all of it, but neither are you free to desist from making your effort. And in some ways, I think it is that which we see so much at the Global Fund, these small 
efforts which seem on some level so incapable of taking on these huge larger challenges are truly what begin to create um, ripples of change that can transform themselves into true social movements and waves of change. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt got it right, I think, when she said, where after all do human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so small you can't see them on a map. Um, I think in the moments when we feel that, well, you know, what difference will it make? What difference is my $5 contribution? What difference is it to try and make a change in homelessness in Santa Barbara? What difference is it, um, you know, how could I possibly do anything by myself? Um, I'm constantly inspired by the kinds of women that we have had the privilege to be able to support. Um, and I'm reminded in their actions that the words of the writer Arundhati Roy, who comes from my country, India, um, who said at the World Social Forum some years ago that another world is not only possible, she is on her way, and on a quiet day, we can hear her breathing. Thank you. What can we do as individuals that you can just kind of share with us on a small or for that matter larger level? Thank you. Uh, you know, I think there are a lot of things that we can do. Um, I've heard from so many people about the, the questions of um, just, for one, educating ourselves more about what is happening in the rest of the world. And I think um, whether it's organizations like the Global Fund for Women, or Women for Women International, or Human Rights Watch, or so many of the really strong, wonderful um, civil society organizations that exist around the world, to begin to see yourself as being involved with any one of them in some sustained way, um, not just necessarily by supporting them financially, but also, I think, spreading their word, learning about the stories, telling those stories, sharing them. Um, I think I'm constantly struck by how um, relatively ignorant we are here, despite all of the access that we have to information. Um, perhaps it's almost an overload, or perhaps we, we trust information better when it comes from friends and partners. Uh, next month is International Women's History. It's um, Women's History Month, and it's also March 8th is International Women's Day. Uh, how many of you know what the origins of International Women's Day are? Which country do you think International Women's Day originated in. Any guesses? Okay, I've heard Europe, Ireland, India, India China, Japan. How about right here in the United States? <laughs> in New York, because of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire because an extraordinary group of women responded to the fact that their sisters were burned alive because they were working in a sweatshop in the late 19th century um, and were then became heroes to the rest of the world. I mean, that's a very small example of what I mean to say in terms of our own ignorance. International Women's Day became scorned by the United States because it got taken up by the socialist cause, because of course it was women workers who first mobilized. And when it got taken up by the socialist cause during the Cold War, it began, seen, it became, it began to be seen as something foreign and, and distant. I think the more we can begin to educate ourselves about our own traditions, I use the Alice Paul example uh, knowingly, because I often get asked, oh, aren't you imposing Western notions of human rights in other countries? Um, I don't think Western civilization woke up one morning and said, oh, we meant to include women. Sorry, forgot that. No, it was actually because in Western civilization, as in every other one, women actually weren't treated with equality, didn't have equal rights, were not able to vote, were considered the personal property of other human beings. And it was women's own efforts to challenge that over decades and centuries that that changed in the context both of the United States and in Europe. 
And it's that same process that is happening in other parts of the world. So I think other things that can be done is also challenging the assumptions around cultural superiority, the assumption that we in the West have already arrived and have the answers, and somehow those poor people are victims of their culture, of their civilizations, but instead to support women within those communities who are really making change themselves. Um, I also think book clubs are a great way of being able to kind of take action and to do this process of education. So whether you use um, Half the Sky, uh, whether you use our new Congo report that will be coming out, whether you use um, a new book that's going to be out um, from Isabel Coleman called Paradise Under Her Feet, which, which talks about Islamic feminism. Um, it's a great way to begin to kind of share a story with a broader group of people. Um, and if you want something more concrete um, next month for International Women's Day, you can sign up and host a house party. And uh, the Global Fund will send you a kit on how to host a house party and spread the word to 10 more people. So um, I think those are some ideas. If women's work, like hauling water uh, and um, the firewood and uh, the things that women do as a daily thing, uh, is now being counted by the UN or uh, if you could explain that a little bit I don't know whether everybody realizes the economic definition of, um, of work in the word of, wor of work <laughs> well that's a great question and um, I, I actually I actually talked about the fact that one of the things we find so interesting is that women are suggesting that it's time we considered a different model of economic growth, one that places far less value on, domestic, on gross domestic product and far greater value on gross domestic well-being. Um, and I think one of the interesting experiences we've had with that is the vast majority of women's work is actually unpaid labor. And so it doesn't figure in to any assessment of gross, gross develop, um, domestic product or gross national product. Um, what that actually means, though, is that women's, the kind of work women do is consistently undervalued. And I think one of, one of my very favorite grants at the Global Fund was a small grant we made to a group of um, women in Spain, which, you know, you might not come to your mind as a place that needs a grant from the Global Fund for Women, but they were mobilizing a, a wonderful um, protest on the 8th of March, actually, called Cuando las mujeres paran, toda se para. When women stop, everything stops. And they basically, it was a strike by women in which women were asked to just simply not do the everyday things that they did. Not take their kids to school, not grocery shop, not make the beds, not go to work, <laughs> not, you know, do lunch boxes, just not. Just not do any of the things that they did. Instead, they were supposed to show up at the square in Barcelona, um, and something like 8,000 women gathered at the square, and the entire economy of Barcelona took a massive hit that day because actually everything did stop. There were no people in the places that people were expecting people to be. People who counted on their lunches being served to them by women didn't have lunch, so they didn't go to work, or they didn't do other things. And I think the ripple effects of that was exactly what they wanted to show. Um, we've, you know, there's a similar film about our reliance in, in, in California on um, the incredible labor of Mexican um, um, laborers called A Day Without a Mexican. And I think women's labor is so taken for granted. We do two-thirds of the world's labor, and we own less than 1% of the world's assets. Um, there is a profound need and women are mobilizing around not only recognizing that work that women do that is unpaid, but also something else that's incredibly important, which is when national governments spend more and more of their resources on, the, on defense, as for example the United States is doing now, it's not that that spending on defense directly affects women which it does as well because we know that violence against women increases in societies that are highly militarized. Um, in Israel, for example, Israeli women's organizations that we support talk about the fact that Israel is one of the countries with one of the highest rates of domestic violence because so many young Israelis 
are exposed to violence in their service, in the military service. But it also affects women because when you spend that much on defense, you have less money for education, for health, for social services, for libraries, for all of the things that build human capital, that enable women and their families to participate better. So it is a two-pronged attack on women's ability to realize their human rights. And if it's bad for us in the so-called developed world, it's 10 times worse in the so-called developing world because in those places, the basic infrastructure is so limited. So long answer to a very good question. <laughs> Does the Global Fund, um, through, through support of grant writing, ever support any kind of institutional, um, institutional cultural change like the... Oh, I absolutely. Um, we, we fund actually a large... Um, the whole issue of women's access to land and title over land is a very, very big issue all around the world. And so one of the interesting ways in which the Global Fund has been very involved with that is we're probably one of the... Um, um, most significant funders of associations of women lawyers. I know lawyers don't usually have a very good rap in the United States, but we love lawyers. Um, women lawyers across the world have um, really been at the forefront of challenging um, legal restrictions on women's ability to um, really own things like land, have their title on um, deeds, um, even small, even other things that you know we may think of or take for granted custody over your children in a, divorce, in a divorce situation. The ability to give your children your own nationality. In many cases, um, in the Middle East, for example, women are not permitted to give their nationality to their children. And so if they're married to a foreign national, um, that person keeps their children because of the nationality issue. Um, so I think there are an, a number of ways in which organizations that we've supported um, uh, really get at some of these institutional factors um, and even in places where there are legal support for women's rights the customary practices undermine that legal right so um, in in much of sub-saharan africa for example when a woman is widowed um, the brother of the husband will simply marry um, the widow uh, marry in name and then become the owner of the land and many of the women's groups we've supported in Mali in Burkina Faso and Senegal are really mobilizing around exactly those kinds of issues um, and I think the combination of having both economic independence um, women being able to have control over the resources that they earn um, in a family and being able to actually have assets in their own name are two ways in which um, we've been very involved with um, supporting change. I'm really interested in the Global Fund for Women. I've heard a lot, but I think this is a really good view into the kind of work you do. And I'm just wondering if there's, you know, I guess generally, I mean specific to me, but generally speaking, um, is there a need for young people? Because I feel that in the work that I've done, uh, with nonprofits and the way things are geared towards people graduating, we're not really um, sort of, what's the right word? They don't really tell you like, yeah, go work <laughs> in the nonprofit sector, you know? Um, <laughs> I guess it's, it's not as glamorous or money making as other things, but um, that's kind of what interests me. So I guess just interested because I have no life plan after June 15th. Um, <laughs> if there's any way to get involved and uh, I'd like to go places and, and hang out with these women. I love so. your question. That's <laughs> Thank you. great. Um, actually, the, certainly for us and, you know, Linnell would, would, would speak more about this if she had a voice today, but um, we couldn't do our work without people like you. I mean, more than 50% of our staff is young women under the age, young women and men actually, wonderful six men who work at the Global Fund, um, and more and more, more and more um, interns who, uh, who are both men and women, which is totally exciting for us because I really think one of the things that I keep talking about is that to be a feminist doesn't require you to actually be either a man or a woman. You can be both, either, neither, whatever you choose. It's about how you see the world and the world that you dream about, you know, in terms of being a more equal place. Um, so I certainly, you know, I'm not in your career counseling center, but um, I think most nonprofits wouldn't be able to survive if it wasn't for idealistic, committed, passionate people coming to work and being willing 
to work for, yes, much less money than you'd make at Google. Um, uh, <laughs> free lunches sometimes, but not the way you would get at Google. Um, and, and I think, you know, it is, um, it is actually one of the things that makes our work both possible but also fun. I mean, I think we have so many, when I think of, you know, all the people I've met, I mean, I joined, when I was recruited to the Global Fund for Women, I was 33 years old. And um, I, you know, first I thought they'd made a really big mistake. And I spent the first five years of my life thinking, oh my God, someone's going to come in and say, you fraud, what are you doing in this job? Um, I, I think there is so much potential for um, the kinds of input and resources that we get from people who are coming out of graduate school, who are coming out of undergraduate programs and out of graduate school, um, who have lots of ideas, um, not necessarily a huge amount of experience. One of the things that I'll say makes it easier, particularly if you want to do international work, is to be fluent in one other language. Um, it's not something most Americans think about until like after you're done with college, but at the Global Fund for Women, you know, we accept re requests in any language. We have a staff that's for the pretty much bilingual. Everybody's bilingual, and there are a lot of people who are quadrilingual or you know, um, multilingual. So I think that's that's something I would I would suggest. And I think a lot of a, a lot of nonprofits also face the challenge of feeling that um, they don't have that much to offer in terms of competitive pay scales and, and, and um, benefits and things like that. But I think um, so many of us depend on people like yourself. So don't get disheartened. Have we reached critical mass? Are there enough of us who are really conscious of this gauntlet that, um, well, basically what Nicholas Kristof has said, that this is the moral challenge of our century? And um, do you think we're there yet? And if we're not there, um, what do we do? And what are the impediments? You know, I think we probably ask ourselves this question at various moments of time. I mean, I think, you know, I'm sure people ask themselves this question in the 60s and 70s, you know, is this the breakthrough moment um, when we passed Title IX in the United States, when the rape law changed in India in 1983? Um, you know, you feel, constantly like, is this the tipping point? Are we here? And what I, what I think I've seen in the experience with um, particularly the struggle for women's, women's rights is in some ways it's maybe the most scary of all social movements because that famous feminist adage, um, the personal is political, is so profoundly true. It's a, it's a place of transformation that truly does begin with each one of us. Um, it's a place of transformation that begins with how you interact with your um, children, how you treat your sons and daughters, how you interact with your lovers, your husbands, your fathers, your brothers. It's so, it, it happens in such an intimate place. You know, it's not like there's an enemy out there. It's not the ruling class. It's not the, um, uh, you know, it's not the colonizers. It's, it's people who you're intimately connected with. And I think... Um, that's partially both the incredible promise of this revolution um, and it's also what makes it very scary and it's also what causes periodic backlash. Um, so every time women feel like we're sort of right at that point uh, and you see it happening right now, I mean, there's such a resurgence of religious fundamentalism and, and, and you know, not not religious fundamentalism in the celebration of the Holy Spirit or the divine, but religious fundamentalism that takes the form of incredible oppression of women. Um, and it's across religions. I mean, it's from, you know, uh, orthodox, uh, you know, orthodox women in Israel writing to us about the um, coercive use of um, fertility drugs on young women who get married into orthodox families, all the way to, um, you know, the things you're much more familiar with in terms of Islam. And, my, my, big, my big bone to pick with Nicholas Kristof is that his, his chapter entitled is, is Islam Misogynistic should correctly have been called Is Religion Misogynistic? Because all religions and all traditions, not just Islam, have strong tendencies that kind of want to keep this in control. And for those of you who went to see Avatar, you know, there was 
on the one hand, this incredible celebration and possibility of this world that was interconnected, but then, you know, you're sort of left with, oh, and in the end, you just like, the Navi people have machine guns. Great, you know? And I think, what I think we need as a world is for all of us, women and men, to begin to envision a different game. You know, it's not anymore the struggle of the 60s and the 70s where it was, you know, let us on, let us on, let us on to your playing field. So we can play the same brutal game in which, you know, the vast majority of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day and people are getting mangled and squashed and none of us have time to spend with our children so we hire women from Guatemala who leave their children to come and look after our children. You know, I think, I think that's an insane logic that we're dealing with. I think men as well as women want to find a different, more sustainable way. I think I meet so many young men who say, I want to spend time. If I'm going to have a family, I actually want to spend time with my family. And I don't think that spending 90 hours at McKinsey is like my idea of, you know, a fantastic way to make a career, even if I am making some absurd amount of money and Goldman Sachs bonuses at the end of the year. I mean, whatever. I just think... That's, that's really why I'm not, I cannot answer you and say, yes, we're at that moment. I think it's a very scary transformation. This transformation that goes against sort of millennia of having left behind our early goddess worship and come to a place where we've kind of all agreed on a very patriarchal form of a god even, <laughs> is a difficult thing to give up because for women as well, by the way, I mean, one of the interesting things that the Global Fund has experienced is sometimes it's men who are the strongest allies for change. And it's mothers and wives who are afraid to let go of what is familiar and what is known. So, you know, in Kosovo, one of the women's groups that we support, it was because fathers in the community said, no, we believe that our daughters should go to school. And we'll stand up for our daughters to go to school. And it was mothers who were like, well, but if they go to school, they'll become too educated and then no one will marry them. And, and men in the community said, we will make sure that our daughters will be respected and that people will marry them because they will choose to be with women who are educated. So I think we're going to go through some more ups and downs and I think it might get harder before it gets better. And I don't think the reaction or the backlash is just from men. It's from the entrenched powers and it's from those of us who feel like it's scary to go to a new place. And that means both women and men. And so my hope is that, you know, we will constantly come back to the place of saying that there is a different way that lies in front of us and it's a way that we can make together. And, you know, that's what gives me a sense of potential.